Guys, I would like to go ahead and get started if we can. Um, I want to, I, first of all, I want to, um, I want to thank you all so much for being here. I like to go, I like to start on time. And as others come in, they can just plug right on in and pick up where, um, where we are. And so, um, so I just want to welcome all of you all here today. Uh, also, I, I want to welcome uh, um, Alexander Bimes here with, um, with Alabama Care. Um, he's going to be uh, doing some recording for us today and also taking us live on Facebook today. And uh, this is actually our first live um, event um, on Facebook. Us? We are recording you today. Oh, cool. And so um, uh, we have gotten a lot of requests from people from literally all around the world asking if these events can be um, recorded or, or be live and in some type of webinar. And so um, with Alexander being here today, uh, that makes that possible. Because a lot of times when it comes to people with disabilities, it's hard for them to come and be in the room. But technology allows them to be a part of the conversation. And so, uh, so it's wonderful that we're able to uh, have that available today. Uh, this is a very um, open platform, okay? Anytime that we are discussing a topic, if there's something that you want to chime in on, feel free to chime in on that. Uh, 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 you're more than welcome to do that. And so uh, this month, our theme for the month of August is self-advocacy, self-advocacy. This is a real important topic, okay? And we're actually going to cover five topics this month related around that theme. And so today, August the 1st, 2019, we are going to cover the topic of understanding your disability, understanding your rights, and understanding your resources, okay? We're going to cover that today. So before we get off into our uh, topic today, I just want to announce one thing. One year ago today, one year ago today, me, a young lady by the name of Rachel Jones, and two other young men, Maurice King and also Brian Smith, we all sat down together and began to discuss um, the possibility of bringing this platform to the Is Able Center. And so the way that the whole concept came up was we would have different individuals coming in uh, throughout the course of the week. And many of them would say, well, I'm really not interested in your employment program. Or, you know, I really, you know, I really don't want to do the support groups or anything like that. But, um, but I, I would like to be involved in something, you know, that can really help enhance the quality of my life, you know. And so we started kind of throwing ideas back and forth. What would be a good thing that we could bring to the table that could help individuals enhance the quality of their lives? And so all four of us had disabilities. Me, I have paralysis. Uh, two other individuals, Maurice and Rachel, they was both blind. And also Brian, he has muscular dystrophy. And so everybody just kind of started talking about, um, well, what it was like for me. And, and, and for me as a person living with paralysis, it was, it was different. Yeah. For a person that was living visually impaired, it was different. For, for a person with muscular dystrophy, it, it was different. And so you'll see that even around the table right now, we have different individuals with different type disabilities. And so it's going to be different, but but the common denominator is, you know, we all need uh, something that can help enhance the quality of our lives. And so what better way to do that than to have life skills slash health and wellness classes where we bring great topics to the table that, can, that, that, that people can take and tangibly apply 
to their lives. So today is actually our one year anniversary. So you want to give me a hand clap, you know, you go ahead and do that. <laughs> so thank you all for that. And to celebrate, I bought you some goodies on the table, some sneakers and Twix and Butterfingers. So, so uh, take a bite out of uh, that sweet stuff on the table today. So, okay, guys. So let's get off into our topic, okay? So I want to, um, first of all, I want to go around the room mm -hmm. and I want to ask you, what do you think self-advocacy is? Let's start with you down there on the end, Paul. What is self-advocacy to you? Well, self-advocacy self -ad uh, is advocating for yourself because whether you know it or not, you know, your parents ain't going to be here for her. Mm. So, mm. you know, it's very sorry. Uh, better start uh, young than get older and not know what to do. Mm. So, mm. Mm. yeah. Uh, step advocate means speak for yourself and speak for others who else can't speak for you unless you want to, unless you want to ask for help or whatever. I like that. I like that. Okay, so to me, self-advocacy means standing up for yourself, educating other people about how you do things or why you do them that way or what's important to you about like how your disability affects or sometimes how it doesn't affect your way of life. And what I mean by doesn't affect is a lot of times in job interviews or just out in society, People think I can't do certain sports or I can't do certain things just because they see the wheelchair. So sometimes you have to take it from a place of advocating for like the fact that no, I can do these things and they've already seen like made the kind of assumption without really knowing that you can't. So you have to take it from what you can and what you like take away the them thinking what you can't do. I like that. Yeah, yeah like that. it's it's because that they 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 did not know, understand then. It's probably mm -hmm. they don't want to make fun of be mean. They just didn't know then, but finally mm -hmm. they changed their mind. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. you can change perceptions or minds. But that doesn't mean they're totally bad. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. wise too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, go ahead. Go ahead. Keep going. But that doesn't mean they're totally bad. No. Mm -hmm. And what does self-advocacy mean to you? Huh? What does self-advocacy mean to you? Um, to, to follow what you're good at. And, okay. And you can ask the people who are willingly to help you, not for those who don't know how to help people. Like, mm -hmm. they don't have the experience, not just for helping people with special mm -hmm. needs, they just mm -hmm. not experienced enough to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. They just mm -hmm. good at their own things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. that's all it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, go ahead. Okay. Well, to me, self-advocacy means standing, standing up for yourself. Mm -hmm. And and also, when you're standing up for yourself, you also are trying to change the stigma or mindset mm -hmm. of the of people who may not think you can do things. Okay. Okay. Um, and knowing knowing your knowing your disability and knowing what you need and being able to speak up and tell someone this. I need this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Hopefully it mm -hmm, works. I mean, I've been through times mm -hmm, where I spoke mm -hmm, up and explained mm -hmm, it didn't work. But mm -hmm, it's important. It means to me speaking up for what you need, mm -hmm, not letting mm -hmm. other, others dictate to you what mm -hmm, you need. Because mm -hmm. everyone's different. Everyone knows what they need. And advocacy, I would say, is when you're advocating means to me when you're advocating for other people for mm -hmm. different for equal rights or mm -hmm. treatment or what, mm -hmm. you know, whatever they need. I was gonna say that self-advocacy can like what she was talking about like advocating for a group of people too because sometimes when I advocate for myself as like a service dog owner or a college student 
it, it has like a trickle effect where it can make professors think, okay, if she can do this with all these various disabilities, mm -hmm. then, okay, mm -hmm. next time I get a student with a disability, period, whether it's the same as mine or not, mm -hmm. they, they don't automatically assume that, oh, that student can't do as well as other classmates because exactly. I've been before them and, and like proven that my disability didn't stop me. It didn't mean that I made Ex exactly. Mistakes, so. Yeah. Exactly. I agree. Exactly. So uh, sometimes when you stand up for yourself, just when you stand up for yourself, it has an impact on everybody. It does. Uh, uh, Chandra, I want to come back down to you. I know you're hard of hearing, so I'm going to talk a little louder. What does self advocacy mean to you? Okay. <laughs> you you don't you want to pass? You want to pass? You want to pass? Don't. Okay, you don't. Okay, let's come back. What does self advocacy mean to you? Me? Yes. Oh, it is presenting yourself to everybody, like uh, what disability you have, uh, mm -hmm. and tell them about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, stand mm -hmm. for your right. You mm -hmm. have to know your right. You do? With disability or non-disability. I have to know my right. You do. I also cannot self-advocacy. I always look up to my husband. What can I say? <laughs> so mm. I also need to learn that. Mm. That, that. That's interesting. That's yeah. interesting what you just said. Yeah. Real interesting. What, what does self-advocacy mean to you? I mean, I think um, not being afraid to um, ask when you need help or Speak up when you feel like you're not being treated right or, you know, being treated unfairly. I think um, you should, you know, speak up and tell them, you know, hey, I don't feel like you're treating me right or, you know, this is not fair. So, you you know, you put yourself out there and let them know that, you know, you're not going to stand for that. You're going to, um, you're worth more than that. So, I think self-advocacy is, you know, knowing your worth and, you know, believing that you are worth, worthy of being treated fairly so i like that everybody had like great points of views and i really liked the different angle that people came from and now before i get into like a really explaining how self self advocate came about i really want to come back to your point because your point of view is really totally different from everybody else's point of view around the table. You said that, and this is really interesting, that you have a tendency to look more towards your husband, but you have to learn to start advocating for yourself. Isn't that an interesting point of view? Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever think about self-advocacy from that point of view? Not until she brought it up, but going off of that point of view, mm -hmm. like, as of and and I think some of this, for me personally, it has come with age. Okay. You know, like, because I'll tell you, like, I have a lot of disabilities. You see the wheelchair; that's kind of obvious. But a lot of people don't know about my other disabilities because maybe I've been embarrassed, ashamed, shy, like mm -hmm. I, or or yeah. like you sometimes fear judgment. So like so, I have to be open about what. Mm. what they can see because there's mm. this big chair here that mm -hmm. we can't get around without talking mm -hmm. about it but like other things that like aren't as obvious mm -hmm. and and so to me going off of like what she was saying about you always look to other people or you like for me I try to I guess in a way I've ran from or tried to hide the ones that nobody had to know about because mm. they couldn't see mm. and so Part mm. of my self-advocacy is like not being ashamed of those things and being like, you know what, I got, I, I have this disability. Yeah, you can't see it, but it's still real, and I can still do college. I can still, mm. I can still mm. live independently. Mm. I can still do all these things mm -hmm. regardless. Mm -hmm. That's really good. You know, uh, uh, tell me your name one more time. Uh, Sanchita. Chandra. Sanchita. That's Santita. so Santita. 
Did I say that correct? Correctly? Yes. Okay. So that's interesting, your point of view. That really struck me because um, even though you are coming from that angle, that's really a, um, a crutch that many of us find ourselves in. Um, I remember early on in my disability, um, I depended on other people to do things for me so much to the point where I didn't, I wouldn't put forth the initiative to do anything because I figured somebody else was going to do it for me, mm -hmm. you know. And see, early on in my injury, I stayed in a nursing home. So somebody cooked my meals three times a day, my bills was paid for me, my medical equipment and supplies was ordered for me. So I didn't have to think about those things for years. So I can remember when I got out of the nursing home mm -hmm. and I came to a transitional living unit, I had this, 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 um, this um, counselor named Leslie Walker. I know her. Yes, if you know Leslie, you know Leslie didn't play. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> Leslie, she was uh, paralyzed from her waist down. Leslie had been a, a, a gold medalist in the Olympics for swimming. I mean, she was just awesome. And Leslie would literally kick my butt. She didn't let me whine and cry about anything. I can remember when I had to start looking up like places where I was gonna get my new wheelchair and where I was gonna order my medical equipment and supplies and when I got ready to start college and how I was gonna get you know my applications in and all that. And so I went to Leslie and I said, so I need to do all this and that. And then she said, what are you looking at me for? I said, well, I said aren't you gonna help me? She said, and this was before the cell phone and the internet and stuff. She said, they go to yellow pages and they go to telephone. <laughs> yeah, that's what she said, you know. <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh, maybe I need to go report this woman or something. <laughs> you know, I was literally thinking that she was mistreating me, you know, yeah. because she was what she was really doing was making me learn independence. And preparing you. For and preparing me that for independence. Yes. Yes. How old was she? Yes. Leslie, mm -hmm. she was, I, I was like 21 at the time, so Les probably was about 30 or something like that. But she had learned it before I did. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? It's she, like a mentoring process. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So that, that was really good. So, so I, I, I really want to wanna say this. If you're finding yourself right now leaning on a parent, a spouse, a friend, an organization, whatever. If you're finding yourself leaning on them, expecting them to get things done for you, you're really doing yourself a great disservice. Go ahead. But uh, it is not easy. Like it's not easy for me. Mm -hmm. It is not easy for anybody. Mm -hmm. But they should be taught. Yes. Yes. That you're right. How to do that with the example and practice with someone? They, mm -hmm. they can stand for it. And you have to be self advocated. You have to be self advocated. Mm -hmm. You can do that. Mm -hmm. You need practice. It's so very true. Really. Very true. And, and like with me early on, I didn't know how to do it. You understand? But you know, and so Leslie, she pretty much throw me in the water and say, learn how to swim. Mm -hmm. But let's let's go back to uh, to to con, 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 Kanala. Kanala. Did I say it right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Kanal's case, he has an intellectual. Intellectual. Intellectual disability. Learning so his, his way of learning is going to be different from my way of learning. I have a physical disability, mm -hmm. but I don't have anything intellectual. So I may be able to get things one time where it may take Kanal more than one time. It doesn't mean that he can't learn. It but it, he, he has to learn differently. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So yeah. his approach, that Les, the approach that Leslie took with me, probably wouldn't be the same approach that would work for him. Yeah. He, he would have to, to be yeah. walked through it, yeah. taught. Maybe, maybe repetition mm -hmm. helps him learn, you know, whereas if it wouldn't take that for other people so so everybody disability is different mm -hmm. it is it's not a one-size-fit-all 
Even if it's you different. have the same visibility, mm -hmm. yeah. there can be 8 million, and I've learned this from coaching kids and volunteering with mm. kids' camps and stuff. Mm. There can be 8 million ways, like how I tie my shoes, there could be 8 million ways for people with CP to do that, but we all have the same diagnosis on paper. Mm. But depending on how that disability affects us, what limbs and whatnot, or or if it affects you somewhat intellectually, then you're going to have to approach things a little differently than like I would to tie shoes or do something simple like that. And a lot of times people don't realize that like even daily tasks can be different with a disability. So true. So true. Depending so on. So true. And I've seen that even, you know, with me with paralysis. I've learned that, you know, the just about every person that I know does things different than the way that I do it. Right. You understand what I'm saying? And honestly, sometimes I have found that their way is even better than my way. Right. You kind of yeah, learn, we learn from each other. other. And yeah. So, but I like to tell people, and part of it's because I'm going to be a teaching student. Mm -hmm. So I see a lot of this in classrooms, too, and working with kids, is that I tell people there is no right or wrong. Sometimes people get hung up on the right or wrong way to do things. Mm. As long as you're accomplishing things, there's no right or wrong way how to learn how to do something or how to accomplish doing it as long yeah. as you're successful in doing it one way or the other. I like that. I like that. I like that point of view. And yeah. one thing also is, Sometimes with your disability, and this has happened to me, the way you've done it, you maybe you do one thing for for years the same way, but then something happens, and you actually end up having to change the way you do that because of different circumstances, mm -hmm. and that's. You know, it's some, there's some people that don't, when they see you, I mean, it's happened to me, where they see me doing something different, they're like, well, you did it this way. It seems so much easier. Why this? And it's like, you know, I have to advocate. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. That way was a lot easier. But it's not, it does not work for me doing it that way So anymore. true. So true. Yeah. And, and you know, Brittany, it's so important that we're open-minded when it comes to that, too. You know, uh, and, and that we allow people to find out what works for them. You understand what I'm saying? That's, that's very, very important. I, I want to go, I want to share a little history uh, about the, the uh, self-advocacy movement and how it all came about. Okay, so I'm going to read this to you. Self-advocacy refers to the civil rights movement for people with developmental disabilities. Now, what you got to understand about developmental disabilities, a lot of times people hear this and they think that developmental disabilities are just for people who have intellectual disabilities. But it's not, it's even much broader than that. I actually have a developmental disability because I was, became disabled before I was 21 years old. So that puts me in that classification as well. Okay, it's a, also called cognitive or intellectual disabilities and other disabilities. It is also an important term in the disability rights movement, referring to people with disabilities taking control of their own lives, including being in charge of their own care in the medical system. The self-advocacy movement is, in basic terms, about people with disabilities speaking up for themselves. It means that although a person with a disability may call upon the support of others, the individual is entitled to be in control of their own resources in how they are directed. It is about having the right to make life decisions without undue influence or control by others. Powerful. When I first got hurt, 
I ended up becoming a ward of the state. So the Department of Human Resources pretty much, you know, owned my life. And they put me in a nursing home. And I remember when I got my first apartment. And the Department of Human Resources came in mm. and told me that I wasn't going to be able to live on my own. That the best thing for me to do was to go back to the nursing home. Now I'm 22 years old and there's nothing wrong with me except the fact that I have a physical disability. And you know that a nursing home is a place that you put people to spend the remainder of their days. It's the, it's, it's the last result. When all options have been looked into, the nursing home is normally the last place that you go. You're going to spend the remainder of your days there. So literally, they was giving up on, up on me before they gave me a chance. So I said to the lady, I said, ma'am, I'm, I'm not going to be staying on my own. My brother is going to be staying with me. And so at the time, my brother was on only uh, uh, just about to turn 19 years old. She said, well, he's only about to turn 19. He can't assume the responsibility of caring for you. And I begged them. I did. They said, no, there's nothing we can do. Make a long story short, two months later, I got a letter in the mail from the Perry County Judicial System which it was the Perry County Department of Human Resources who wanted to put me back in the nursing home. And the judge ruled against them. They had went and petitioned the courts to put me back in the nursing home and the judge ruled against their petition and pretty much told them that you have to give him an opportunity to prove that he can live on his own just like anybody else. Yeah. And That's I saw- the crime that they're doing. Yeah, it really is, it really is. And I saw, I saw the name of the attorney listed. In the 1970s, they gave the rights to the people with disabilities. Why are people still doing it now? You're right, you're right. It's just like why there's still racist people now. You're right, you're right. And I wanna, I wanna come back and touch on that, okay? But I wanna finish sharing this point with you. And so, uh, so I saw the name of the attorney listed that was the attorney that was actually, I guess she was a court appointed attorney to me, but she never called me or anything. I didn't even know I had an attorney. But she was, I guess, like my ram in the bush, okay? You know, she literally fought for me and helped me, you know, win this case against the Department of Human Resources. But, but here I am now. This was back in 1999, okay? They told me that I couldn't live on my own, that I could not, that I needed to be in a nursing home. Now, here I am 20 years later. Not only did I live on my own, but I went on to get married, okay? My daughter here at the time, she was five years old, okay? And she would come up, you know, up on the summertime, and it would just be me and her. And literally, we would ask her, did we ever miss a meal or anything like that? <laughs> and I would ride her on the back of my wheelchair. We would have an awesome time. And, and then I went on to meet a, a wonderful woman. We got married, been, been together 15 years now. Me and her had three more kids, you know, and, 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 and drive my own vehicle, you know, open up this place, you know, you know living my dream, you know, to, to pour into the lives of other people. But, but the thing is, though, is that I had to fight for my right, though. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And none of that would have been possible. None of that would have happened. None of it. And Go ahead. It just goes to show you don't let other people's perception or what other people think you can do be your mm -hmm. limit. And I tell that to kids that I mentor with, mm -hmm. whether it's through schools, track and field, whatever. Mm -hmm. I say don't, you know, use that. Like, if they're giving you some type of negativity or some type of, we don't think you can do this or whatever, use that to fuel your fire to be like, you know what, I'm going to prove you wrong. Watch this. And then, like, down the road you'll be able to say, see, you didn't want to give me a chance, but this is why you should have, because look at where I'm at now. Mm. And it doesn't have to always be big things. It can be, you know, in the school that I work with, 
Yeah. We celebrate every small achievement, like mm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we have to, um, to know what our rights are. And, and not be afraid to fight for, for those rights, correct? Yes. Correct? Mm -hmm. yeah, like, go ahead, you want to say something? Oh, hey. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm a Chandra. Mm -hmm. um, I want to forge y'all about me. I'm, ah. okay. um, I'm home healer. I'm a disability. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to learn how to, to live my own. Yeah, learn how to be yeah. responsibility. Learn how to control myself not to be angry. Mm -hmm. You know, when somebody says something you with ever, no. no. I've tried to walk like walk away from a other person to get the attitude to me. Or they try to control me like if something wrong with me, like they yeah. think my thing. Yeah, I am a military yeah. military problem or if something wrong I'm retarded, yeah. it's not true. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I'm born yeah. the way is I'm part of you, you mm -hmm. yeah. it's all I am. Mm -hmm. So, I'm trying to live better for my mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And I have a son, he's 22, and I got a friend baby, she's 22 months. Mm -hmm. So, I got my own transportation myself. I love like to travel. I like to go shopping. I like to do all different things. I like to meet with people. I like to go to church. I love to read the Bible. I love a lot of things. And my future, that one day God see me a good man for my life and my future. Mm. So I don't want to be a lonely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't want nobody else. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. talking about mm -hmm. my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. good. That's good. And I want to I want to come back to that because uh, and, and talk on that too, Chandra, because as y'all notice, Chandra, she shared that she's 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 legally deaf. OK, so as you know, people who are deaf, they they're the way that they uh, um, understand is different from the way that we, when we speak and we hear it a certain way, they hear it a totally different way. OK. Have you noticed when they talk, they you know how they talk and different? She's understanding her disability, okay. And all of us got a different disability. What we were saying earlier, the approach to one person's disability is different from the approach to another person. You got to understand what your disability is, okay. You have to. And part of, part of advocating is not only understanding what your disability is, but also as Chandra just did. Being able to explain to other yeah. people what your disability is. Yeah. That's very important. Very, very important. It's very important, okay? Because uh, sometimes, you know, because I look around the room, and if, if me, me, Mallory, Paul, and Jason, we're all in wheelchairs, so it's visible that we have a disability. But it's not so visible that, 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 that the rest of you guys have a disability. So somebody might see you all out somewhere and may not think that you have a disability. So Brittany, how do you explain that to people? If you, if, how do you explain your disability? Well, that, it, there's, the first case of it's really um, hard is that my main disability is an, is an undiagnosed neurological autoimmune disability that hasn't been discovered. Well, so I've learned from my neurologist that basically the best way to explain it is it's like multiple sclerosis or MS, but it's not. But it acts like um, they have never tested positive for that. Oh, yeah. And then, you know, and explaining, I mean, like, I have a feeding tube. And some people are like, will you pick me? And I'm like, yes, but I can't eat the, the ba a balanced milk. Yeah. The day to, to, to survive. And they don't always, and sometimes they're like, 
but you're eating, you're getting calories, and like, there's not balance. And some, and they'll ask me, well, so are you on soft foods? No. You know, what I can eat, it depends on the consistency, the day, my esophagus is messed up. And so, some days are better than others. Consistency, the day, um, and just, you know, it, I mean, that's basically. Mm hmm Conchandra? Conchandra. Conchandra. <laughs> Do you ever have to explain your disability to other people? Not much. Not much? If you had to, how would you? Like, telling people I'm very smart. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because they would have a misconception to think that you're not. Yeah. But you are. Yes, you are. that's correct. Mm-hmm. 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 Very, very important. Very important that you're able to self-advocate in that way. That you're able to tell people, here's, here's, here's what it is for me. And here's why it's different for me. Because one thing you have to understand is that for those people who have not really been around people with disabilities, mm -hmm. they really don't know how to interact with us or know what it is that we need. And so, and so, so it's very important that we are able to self-advocate for ourselves in that way that we're able to calmly explain ourselves to those people. And what Chandra said is that she got to learn how to do it without getting angry. And that's actually, that's actually one, of our, uh, one of our topics that's actually going to come up on August the 22nd. We actually going to talk about advocating assertively without anger. So I don't want to go down that, down that road today because we're going to get on that topic on the 22nd, it's going to be a really, really great topic, too, because uh, a lot of people, just, they are angry because they, they feel misunderstood and different things like that. So we are going to come back to that. OK, yeah. so so it's very important that you're able to self-advocate in that way. So let's go to the rights part, the rights part of it. Do everybody in this room feel that you understand what your rights are as a person with a disability? Oh, yes. Is, or no? that, is that we. We have a right to give our opinion, a right to vote, and a mm -hmm. right to eat wherever you want, yeah. and a right to try your favorite stuff. No That's one right. cannot tell you about your opinion. No one cannot hurt you about your opinion. Of It goes for everyone, even people without disabilities. And mm -hmm. no one cannot tell you who you should vote, and mm -hmm. that you're not allowed to vote. And that's all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. Everybody else, do you understand your rights as a person with a disability? Mm -hmm. I think so. Um, mm -hmm. I know that, like, as far as rights for, like, medical equipment, you know, service animals, like, even employment and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, I think it's important, and sometimes, like, as you're younger, it's one of those things, like, you're talking about, they need teaching, they need to learn. Mm -hmm. You have to learn, like I learned through Lakeshore Foundation where I did mm. sports at and stuff. You have to learn, like, because employers are not supposed to discriminate because of disabilities, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then you get into the whole idea of there are, I mean, sometimes, and I've experienced this myself, sometimes there are loopholes because they're not going to tell you, like, I didn't hire you because you're disabled. They could just say they found a better candidate. But then again they could do that to everybody mm, yeah. Yeah. So, so true so, so true when, when you feel like you're getting discriminated against you may in a way be but at the same time they could do that to anyone that it's applied. so true so true so true i you know i i want to i want to take a little different direction and i really want to come back to to what chandra said uh because you know this may not be uh, something that, that people acknowledge, but it's very true. She said that she wants to have somebody in her life to spend her life with. Do you know that, believe it or not, I, I can say this because 
I know it's true because I've had it said to me that there are people who think that because you have a disability that you don't have the right to have somebody else in your life to, to, to experience love, to, to, to have a spouse in your life. There are people who think that. They really do think that. Or sometimes yeah. the person like you're, and I'm sharing from personal experience, sometimes the person you're dating or like their family mm -hmm. may think Feel that, that way. Get scared or think that, oh, that means you're going to have to be their caregiver. Because like I was engaged and his mm -hmm. sister talked him out of marrying me because I hurt my back like I tweaked it doing sports or something. Mm. And she thought, oh, like, and she told him, not, she convinced him not to marry me because he might be my caregiver. Mm, mm. And the truth of the matter is, if you have a disability and you meet somebody who's not disabled, yes, there is going to be some level of responsibility on that person. But that does not mean that you don't have the right to explore love and having a spouse in your life. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? At the same time, though, true love, like, okay, say my fiance at the time, his name was John Nathan, say we were, you know, engaged and going to get married. If something happened to him and he got hurt doing something, I feel like I would try my hardest to take just as much care of him mm, mm. as he would try to take care of me. Mm. So I feel like love and relationships in that way are a two-way street anyway. Like, mm, or mm. should be anyway. So I met my wife and uh <laughs> And it's actually a, a lady that I really respect and love. But, uh, but she said to me, she said, uh, she said, um, she must be a very special girl because I don't think I could do it. You know, and, and I just changed the subject. And I know that she really was, she wasn't trying to be offensive. But she did not realize how that statement hurt, hurt me by saying, I couldn't do it. In other words, I wouldn't be able to love you because you're disabled. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, and so so it takes somebody who is set apart, who's, you know, different per se to love somebody with disability. That's not true. That's not true. My wife, a beautiful woman, could have had a pick at any Man, she wanted. And I asked her, I said, why did you choose me? You know what she said? She said, because you was the most confident man I ever met. She didn't say because something physical or anything. She fell in love with me. You understand what I'm saying? So you have the right to explore love. You have the right to, to seek relationships and and have a, a significant other in your life just like everybody else. Don't let nobody tell you that you don't because you're deaf or you're intellectually challenged. Or you're, or, or you're four feet tall. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> or anything. You, you have the right to explore that. So keep that in mind. And advocate for that, okay? Advocate mm -hmm. for that if you, if you have to. You know, advocate for that. It's very, very important. So... Uh, Another, um, 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 going back to our rights, um, so let's talk about, um, we talked about the rights on employment. Let's go back there. You said about employment. Now, do you, do you understand that, uh, that there are something called reasonable accommodations inside the employment place that you can ask for, you know, when you become employed, it may like everybody situation is different. Mm -hmm. OK, so everybody's going to need something a little different. So it may be as for me, you know, if I'm working at a desk, I'm probably going to need that desk to sit higher than the average desk. So mm -hmm. a reasonable accommodation for me would be, could you put something up under the legs to make it sit higher? I'm not asking for anything. Big, I'm asking them to tear down a wall and, you know, and, and build a new room just for me. Just something reasonable. Yeah. But, but you got to be able have the, the courage to ask for those things if you're already employed or if and when you do start seeking employment. Okay. So, so start thinking about that now 
if you ever start pursuing employment or if you're already employed, what what do you need? And and don't be afraid to ask for those things from your employer. Yeah. It's very, very important. Very important. Okay, can I throw Go ahead. Idea? Yes. Because like I feel like not enough businesses have enough education or understanding mm, sometimes mm. to accommodate that though. Mm. Because like I got diagnosed with something after I started working somewhere. And I asked for wow. what I thought was a reasonable accommodation. And they basically told me, no, you can't do what you're asking for. But it was about taking medica certain now, medication. Do you, that I know. do you understand? And then it was like, you can't do that, but don't have this medical problem behind the desk either. Because if you do, we'll fire you. Wow. Was, was the response I received. Wow. And so my thing is, how do you navigate a negative? I mean, what I ended up doing was I just quit. And see, but go ahead. I'm sorry. I, but I quit because it was triggering. Like I have multiple disabilities. So one thing was triggering another. And it was like I was not in a good place because I couldn't take my medicine at work, basically. But I was also told don't faint which is what can happen if I don't take it. Don't fake behind the desk because we'll fire you. Mm -hmm. And so I don't really know how to, I guess what I'm saying is I didn't have enough experience at the time to know how to navigate those circumstances. Okay. Not okay. everybody care about people's anxiety issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like that they don't understand personality traits. Mm -hmm. So true, yeah. so true. Yeah. So tr Anybody got an opinion about what, what Mallory just said? Because I, I have one. But I'll let you chime in before I do, if you have an opinion about that. She said that basically she quit. So do you have an opinion about that? I mean, I, I mean, I would never, I would never tell someone to quit. I would probably maybe talk to someone else that you, you know and say, okay, is there, can you recommend a different accommodation, reasonable accommodation that I could try with them? Right. Not just give up with the first one. And you may have tried multiple. I, I'm just saying, if that was the first time, I wouldn't just give up. I would say, or even ask the employer. Okay, you don't want to give me the exact accommodation I'm asking for. Is there an accommodation that you can think of that would be almost like a compromise to, to that accommodation? And, and if they come up with something, it may not work for you. And you may have to say, it's not going to work for me. Well, I, I wanted to explain a little more Go ahead. This on why I... Okay, it, okay. But it was because I was told, and this was my first, like, I started part-time, then I got promoted to full-time, and it was my first experience, and I found the job on my own. But then I was told, basically, you quit or we fire you. So being that I was so new to it and, like, not yeah, used to yeah, how to navigate yeah. it, I quit because I thought it would look better than being fired. Being fired. Yeah. And then it, all, it always follows you around, you know. And you guys, listen, listen to this. This is a great learning experience, okay? Well, that's why I'm sharing. This is a great learning experience that Mallory is sharing. Because there was a question online to say, is that some type of discrimination? Very. Very. I would, I, would, I would reply and say, yes, it is. You know, that it is some form of discrimination. Wouldn't you agree, Mallory? I would definitely agree. But the other thing I did that I didn't share initially was... I asked for, like, so there was this closed door meeting of, like, me and three of my supervisors. And they wouldn't let, like, anybody else in there to support me. Mm -hmm. in the, and so it was like I was being ganged up on. But then at the same time, I asked for my, because I knew a friend that had said, you're supposed to be able to get representation if you feel, like, bullied or discriminated against or whatever. So I asked them for a representation, like a rep or whatever. And they said, no, you don't qualify, you don't get one, you don't need one. Your this friend was correct. This isn't that serious. 
kind of thing. And I was like, okay, you're basically telling me to quit or I'll be fired. But then you're telling me I don't get representation. Like I don't yeah. need help. I yeah. don't need somebody in my corner basically is what they were mm -hmm. saying. And mm -hmm. I'm like, it sure does start and feel like mm -hmm. I need somebody in my corner over here because yes, yes. it's three of you against me. And, and part of the reason like I quit is because I had tried very many avenues of like reaching out and asking for accommodations and asking for help with various like this was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back mm -hmm. because I had had other things too where they had denied things and not been very receptive and I was just like mm -hmm. when you start messing with my medicine on top of everything mm -hmm. else mm -hmm. and I couldn't find a middle ground with them mm -hmm. I was like it's better my health wise for me to quit it's mm -hmm. <laughs> it's better than carrying around you got fired Mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. your like mm -hmm. around with you when I go to like do other jobs so true we Ma don't know Ma how long it would have been before you you said that, that medicine is to prevent you from passing out and you don't mm -hmm. know how long you would have kept that job mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. but I when would you have passed out would have been the next day would it have been two months from that day? yeah you know you don't know mm -hmm. no idea but you know when you I see where you're saying you know on the back burner Mm -hmm. I'm probably going to get fired because I can't take the medicine that keeps, that keeps me from passing out. So, you know, why I kind of get what you're saying. Why would I stay here? Because even if you stayed there working until you passed out, you know, you knew in the back of your head. It would happen I'm eventually. Gonna, I'm going to get fired eventually. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I guess my thing is the trying to negotiate like she had mentioned i did all those things and mm. nothing seemed to be working yeah can i chime in on yes. that I, I appreciate it and also those of you who are online who are uh, getting engaged in this conversation i really appreciate it i want to hear more of your comments on mm. that but i want to chime in on this um s advocating at times will not be easy okay it will be difficult sometimes mm -hmm. and sometimes advocating means that you're going to have to be willing to go the extra mile to get what is right for you mm -hmm. okay now now being assertive you you don't have to get angry but that doesn't mean you might have to knock on some doors you wouldn't normally knock on or, or go above some people that you wouldn't normally go above but if you know what you need is right, and it's really not really dis dis disrupting the atmosphere of the, the, the workplace, it's really not going to harm anybody. Because those things that you mentioned was not going to disrupt the atmosphere. It was not going to harm anybody. They just didn't want to be inconvenienced in any type way. So they looked at you as an inconvenience. So it'd be better to get rid of this inconvenience than to accommodate this person. And so what you have to do, advocate means that sometimes you got to go over some heads and you got to knock on some doors or, or, or you know, and, and rattle some cages to get what you need. OK, mm -hmm. because honestly, in that case, it would have been better to be fired than to quit because. Because to stand up for yourself and to show this company that you're not going to allow them to discriminate against you when what you're asking for is really a reasonable accommodation. And, and in the long run, it would have shed a worse light on the company than it would have on you. Yeah, because it would have heard. See, it would have been wrongful termination. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so all I was and, asking for to clarify mm -hmm. is I wanted them to get somebody to cover the desk like I was in mm -hmm. Exactly. I was wanting to get somebody to cover the desk so I could go to the bathroom and give myself insulin. What, 15 minutes tops? Five, ten. Five, okay, exactly. Yeah. The reasonable accommodation. Reasonable accommodation. So this is a great learning experience for those around the table. For those who are coming in online, if you ever find yourself in that situation, just know that advocating is not always easy. I'm sorry it's not. Up it's so not. Much. No, this is it. This is the this is the platform for you to speak on it. Okay. Now I wanna I wanna I wanna uh, kind of I wanna uh, share this this second line here where it talks about because sitting around the table we do have three people around the table who do have some some intellectual uh, disabilities. And I'm sure there are some online. And so we talk about how 
um, it's different for those who have intellectual disabilities, okay? So listen to this right here. People with intellectual disabilities are often some of the most powerless members of society. They may live in a large institution or in a smaller residence known as group home, which are staff-directed environments where residents have little or no control over their living conditions or with whom they share their living space. People with intellectual disabilities are extremely vulnerable to abuse due to social or physical isolation. They are eight to 10 times more likely to suffer sexual abuse than the non-disabled population. The self-advocacy movement seeks to reduce the isolation of people with disabilities and give them the tools and experience to take greater control over their own lives. The self-advocacy movement for people with intellectual disabilities lags far behind many other civil rights efforts, such as those related to race or physical disabilities. This is due to many factors, including low literacy and other communication challenges that are a barrier for people with intellectual disabilities. Anybody want to chime in on that? Anybody got an opinion about that? Um, I mean, okay. Can you read the first like sentence again? I yes, had, I can. I had a point about mm -hmm. that. People with intellectual disabilities are often some of the most powerless members of society. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. Well, I think personally, I think. It may, it, to a lot of people, it appear, may appear that way. Times are changing. Mm -hmm. And why I say it may appear that way is because of the way history has treated people with intellectual disabilities. Mm -hmm. They get born, they're put into an institution, they're never really taught anything. Um, so they don't know, they, if they were put in an institution from a child, from a baby, they're not taught. So there are things those people can learn if they were taught from the beginning. Yeah, am I saying, I mean, th yeah, they're, we still gonna yeah. they're still going to have challenges. They're still going to have challenges. But I think a lot, that not a lot, I won't say, I, I know some of it is because people don't try to teach them. Even in elementary schools, you'll hear them, oh, well, we're, all our students are fully in the classroom, are in the classroom all day. You know what happens in a lot of those classrooms? The student with a disability. Because in the corner. Well, maybe in the corner, but maybe at a desk with other kids. But it just sits in the room and plays the iPad all day. They don't try to do this. And this is one thing I'm very passionate about is getting, using other peers to help them learn mm. things. So a lot of this, people may not be, some people may not ever be able to learn to read. But they can be taught, well, okay, uh, you know, th this, lo this logo, like on the, this flyer, when you see it, oh, well, this is about the Is Able Center. They can learn pictures and relate, and relate the pictures to things. There are things that can be learned if they are actually included or they may do something different the teacher may change the, change something for the whole classroom that they're doing it because of this student but it's a change that will work for all the other students mm, mm. i like that i like that and you know having this have maybe one student who does the ipad Maybe they put the classroom, a power 
PowerPoint together where maybe the other students are the ones who compose the PowerPoint, but they put it together. And then they do it. So sometimes changing things around will help with that. I like now that. Also the abuse. Okay. It is true. That because people think they can get away with it because people think that people with intel with a disability, intellectual or non, aren't gonna realize, oh, mm. this is wrong. Mm. And th they're gonna be easier. Mm. I have between the ages of two and four more than one time mm. was molested. And I was at a daycare mm. to help me get into be independent mm. with my disability. And I think when you isolate it, yes, because people are going to go there and think, oh, well, we can do this, and they're not going to say anything. I was threatened. I didn't say anything for a long time. But you know what happened? My behavior changed. So my mom recognized mm. I was mm. a different person mm. and knew something was wrong. Mm. Mm. And finally came to me, and I finally, you know, let, let, told her. Mm -hmm. But, so, if you, that, so yeah, putting, isolating people, you're going to have a higher, especially group homes with intellectual yeah. people. Because yeah. they don't realize. They, a lot of them, because they haven't been taught about, okay, well, it's okay for this person to touch, you know, hold your hand. Mm -hmm. But, it's not okay for them to... Hit you and or touch you in certain or, places. Yeah, or touch you in certain places. Mm -hmm. Some of these people aren't taught that, and that's why they they is a high, they're at a greater risk because they think these they these individuals aren't going to realize it's wrong, and a lot of them won't because mm -hmm. they were never taught. Brittany, can I chime in on yeah, that? Sorry, this is so good. One thing I like about this platform, and this is why we call it Life Steals. Because it gives us an opportunity to really touch on topics that don't want to be discussed, okay? But they are part of real life. And the reality of, of real life is that oftentimes people with disabilities and even more so those with intellectual disabilities are abused, even sexually, okay? Mm -hmm. And I remember um, uh, um, Karen Cobb sharing something with me that had blew my mind. She told me that that pe that women with intellectual challenges are are is among the highest numbers of those in sex trafficking. And I did not realize that that blew my mind when she shared that with me. I had never even thought about that, but but you but that you know in a sense makes sense. You will go out of out of those who are more vulnerable, more, more less inclined to speak up for themselves and different things like that. So I'm really glad we're exploring this avenue with this topic today because what I want to say for those of you who are around the table, those who are online who are watching too, if you are in a situation that you're feeling uncomfortable about being touched in a certain way or, 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 or you know, and I'm talking sexually, okay, and you know that it feels uncomfortable, Part of self-advocating for yourself is speaking up and telling someone that I am being treated in a way that makes me feel uncomfortable. All right? So that's part of it. And someone can Come help around. you decide if it's actually something, if it's just, you know, some people are, just, are like, you know, they, some people say don't get in my space or bubble. So sometimes it's not anything wrong. So when you get into it and they say what happened, they're like, oh, well, no, that, that, that's not abuse. But speaking up, if you feel uncomfortable about a situation, you should tell someone. It may end up, they say, oh, no, they, just, they were just being kind. And you, you just don't like people mm. really close to you. But if you're uncomfortable, speak up and someone can help you figure out if something wrong really happened. I, I want to I wanna say this too, Brittany, one thing you mentioned, and it's very important, if we have parents who are, who are listening to this too, 
especially if you're a parent of a child that have an intellectual disability. Brittany said that her mom recognized that she was different, that something was wrong. Mm -hmm. Because now it can be hard for somebody who doesn't have any type of disability who is being sexually violated in a certain way to go and tell somebody. Because mm -hmm. they are they gonna believe me? You understand yeah. thinking that way. Yeah. And so 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 even more so for you know those of us who are, are intellectually challenged, because you know, are they gonna or is that person gonna say, well, you know, they're intellectually challenged, they they really making that up or something like that. So really be open to knowing when your child behavior has changed after they have been at another place that probably you they didn't normally go to that place or or they've been there for a while but they act a little different when they get ready to get out of the car now or when a certain individual comes around they are a little bit more um, they begin to not talk or open up start looking because all of those are signs okay that you need to start looking for if you are a parent with a child that have an intellectual because disability. Even if you, the child didn't say something, the child, it's going to affect that child. Mm. Like for me, I had never had a nightmare before. I started having nightmares. I was threatened any time the way I went was brought up. Um, I would start getting upset. And I was had separation anxiety. Mm. And I was a happy go lucky little child. Mm. And at five, I mean, my mom finally said that I was in time out one day, angry kick in the tonic cabinet. And she finally came over and said, Brittany, what is wrong? And she knew it wasn't wasn't whatever I did, whatever I was in time out. That's what she knew. And so it is important for parents to look for major difference in your child. You know, it, now it's different, you know, if they go to daycare and then, they, then they're not wanting to go, you know, sometimes kids just don't want to go. But if it ends up, you see that is actually a very, very traumatic thing. Like even if it's brought up, even if you're not on your way to the daycare or wherever they're at, if it's brought up in a conversation and your child gets upset about it, there's something. It you it you it can't you can't bottle it up. It's gonna mm -hmm. affect the mm -hmm. child in some it's gonna affect anyone, child mm -hmm. or an adult, in some way. They're mm -hmm. either gonna get bitter, not not trust anybody, you know, not you know, nightmares. Sometimes and with me I didn't say anything because I was threatened. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I mean, so you, parents, caregivers, you, if you, if you have someone that you've gotten into a new place, watch them. I'm not saying cover over, but just watch them. See if their behavior at home changes. If it changes for, and obviously, for the worst, then sit down with them and say, what is going on? You know, what is happening? Mm -hmm. And I came out with mine to my mom and I mean, yeah, we did do the right thing by going to court, um, but pay attention. Because it, it's going to come out in some way. Mm -hmm. Even if they're not saying it, something's going to be different. Mm -hmm. Can I chime in on that? Yeah, I'm sorry. So this is so great. I'm so glad that you explored that topic. So I want to say this um, to caregivers, parents. Part of self-advocacy is because is a lot of times maybe you will think that you don't really need to have that bird and bee conversation with your child because they're intellectually challenged, well, they're never going to want to explore. That's not true. You still need to have that conversation, 
-hmm. and you still need to teach them what is appropriate, what is inappropriate, that's part of self-advocacy, mm -hmm. okay? It's very important. So I want to kind of shift gear a little bit. Can I kind of pose a question to you? As a parent of a child with an intellectual disability, what has been one, you would say, one of your greatest challenges when it comes to self-self-advocating for your child? Like, um, I always have to uh, ad do the advocacy for him. Okay. He never could do it. Okay. So any meeting or anything, like, he's not there. So I have to do that. So I have to teach him that. Mm -hmm. And I have to because teach him. Because a lot of times I would be at home. Uh, because watching TV, because sometimes I don't feel like a, sometimes when I'm worried that there'll be kids. Teaching children. him what to say, what not to say. Not yeah, teaching. yeah, yeah. Just like sometimes when there are children around, I sometimes say that I wish there's no toddlers around, only oh. just three. Okay, and that covered that what he has to say, yeah. what he doesn't have yeah. to say. And before we go somewhere, I prepare him. Okay. We are going there. They, they all are going to be there. Mm -hmm. That's what you act. Mm -hmm. But four is not toddler anymore. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he asks that he is appropriate or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when after behavior that uh, we come home, we talk about it. Mm -hmm. and today what went wrong, what mm -hmm. he did not do good, and what mm -hmm. even praise what he did good. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. that's, that's good. Thank you for sharing that. So uh, as in our last 15 minutes or so, I want to talk a little bit about resources, okay? It's very important that you understand what your resources are, okay? What I need may be different than what you need. It's obviously that Chandra is not going to need a wheelchair, okay? But she may need some type of hearing aid device. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? So how know how to advocate, you know, part of self-advocating is knowing what your resources are, or uh, putting in the, the research to how do you get these resources when, um, if and when you need them, uh, looking for different funding sources to acquire these things. All of those things are very, 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 very important, you know, uh, to, to, for self-advocating, okay? Very, very important. Mm -hmm. so, so put the work in to do that. No, no, and, and also knowing what is your, um, so let's say if you got insurance and insurance, covers 80% of it or something like that. You know, part of self-advocating is knowing how are you going to cover that other 20%. Is that something that you pay for yourself? Do you find uh, a, another resource that is able to cover that? Mm -hmm. So that's part of being uh, self-advocating as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Go ahead. One thing on top of it. When... A, a, a parent or a caregiver such as yourself is looking at new resources to help your the child or the person you're caring for include them I mean mm, now, right. okay. now granted a an eight-year-old is probably not gonna have the attention span to for you to explain okay well this we're looking at how we're going to get your money, we're applying for Medicare and this and this. But I would say when they hit 13, 18, they need to start being. Like mm -hmm. if you're trying to decide, for instance, a, 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 I mean like I have a home health service. Now mine was just given to me when I had a surgery and they recommended it. but. If you're actually having to research and find one on your own for the for for either your for you, for your for a family member, let them be a part of the decision. And say, okay, well, this place has A, B, and C. This place has A and C, and this place has B and C or and D. These are what they do. Which one do you feel? Talk to your the your child or the person you're caring for and say, which one of 
like these places, I'm looking at these three places, these, mm -hmm. any of these we can afford and whatever, which would work best for you? Because they are going to know, because honestly, people say, well, pa and parents do know what's best for their children, but when it comes down to maybe how they need to learn or what, what sometimes they, they know what they need a lot of times, what the kind of help they need. Um, so if they don't need, let's say, um, assistance, personal assistance, well, then maybe not go with the home health that would send somebody out three days a week or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. But make them, whatever you're researching for, make them part of it. Whether mm -hmm. you're researching to find a new wheelchair and you look at three different companies or three different models and, and just make them a part of it. Chris, you want to chime so in? Yeah, I wanted to chime in on that because that's very important, um, especially for kids who are receiving SSI. And for mm -hmm. parents who are the representative understand. payees and parents really need to understand that it's really not the parents' money at all. It's the money to help the, the child, you know what I mean? But, mm -hmm. but at a certain point, the child needs to learn money management. Um, especially, like for an example, me, I went to college and um, my mom was... My mom didn't really tell me how much money I had coming in. I didn't know what the full amount was. And so I would call home and ask for money, but I thought I didn't have any money. So really, I had a whole seven, 721 check to myself that would not have put me into debt, but I didn't know that because she was using it for yeah. herself and to get me things too. It wasn't like, you know, she didn't help me out, but I, w I would probably only see $150 out of that 721. And I was all the way in Tuskegee, you know what I mean? So yeah. it was something that could have... It was something that could have helped me understand how to manage my money better and wouldn't have put me into debt. Um, and there, there, there are also things, like she said, children need to be included in everything that you do for them so that when they, be, when they become of age, they'll be able to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. Because parents won't always be there, and that child mm -hmm. has to become an adult, you know? So, yeah, so part of knowing your... If, if the parents are the representative payee, well... Uh, make sure they understand what that means. Right. Like you did not under like you I did not understand. Did not, right. And so you didn't think you had money. Well that needed to explain to you because that was your money. Right, exactly. And so it needs to explain so if they're on Medicare they can un understand where the money's coming from, mm -hmm. why they're getting it, what things would kick that check away. Right. Well, so, services, not just money, services. Right. Even. So, I mean. So, so, I really like that, Chris, because um, part of uh, self advocating is in, in knowing what your resources are, it's also knowing what type of benefits that you are receiving. Right. It's very and important that you, that you understand that and you know that. Or how okay. you can use them. And how you can use them. Certain funds are like allotted for certain things. Mm hmm. And you can get in trouble for using them for the wrong thing. But if you've never been educated on, right. okay, these funds are for, you know, wheelchairs or these funds mm -hmm. are for other medical supplies or, or these funds are so you can make sure you got a, ha a place to live. Mm -hmm. you, you may not understand all those different dividends. And if you don't, then you could find yourself in, wait, I used that for that and didn't realize that was a mistake. Mm. Like not realize you're making mistakes by using them in mm -hmm. the wrong context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think some people try and this may be a little bit and I think people need to people try to I would say protect sometimes people with disabilities from making mistakes. Right. Mm, right. I like that. Which, I like that. I like honestly, that. Honestly, making mistakes is part of learn. life. I like that. I like that. Right. Yeah. I Let like them that. make mistakes. Right. Everybody makes mistakes. Don't protect them from make, not making mistakes. I kind of learned because I am, I, I am good with math, but I was in a certain amount of money. I'm like, oh, well, you know, it's fine. I, I'll be fine. I don't, I don't need to write it down. You know, on my, you know, on a record keeper of what mm. I spend. And I have got overdrawn several times. I didn't go and spend like, you know, a million dollars here. Mm -hmm. But 
you know, I learned that I did waste money. I mean, there's twenty dollars here, thirty dollars here, ten dollars here, but it adds up. But if I didn't make that mistake, I wouldn't have been able to learn right. that. Okay, right. I need to keep it because right. it it adds up fast. Right. Mm. I like that. I like mm -hmm. that. Right. I like Me, that. The dollar store. <laughs> that, that is that's a dangerous place for me yeah I made that mistake not to let me make mistake but uh -huh. it's very hard yeah. right. I like, yeah, I like want, that you mom. want your child to you be want the best one you want, you the best want to protect right. them and that's a good thing but yeah. like that is my mistake I mean, and you <laughs> gotta I mean, you have to find that balance yeah. like Some like you do need to protect them you know mom. you know because yeah. you're gonna know him better than anyone okay and so what you have, so you're going to know when he's treading in dangerous waters, but also as a parent, you got to understand when you're really not letting him have enough room to, to, grow. to, to, to grow, to, to find his wings right. per se, right. you know? So, so yeah, so I know I <laughs> understand. The greatest fear that if I'm not there, somebody will not treat him the way yep. how they treat like, him. You're right, he, should, he should be right, right. Yeah. Right. Well, right. Well, but I think he will take it. I, but I, that would that give him a chance to learn how to speak up for himself to you and say, Mom, this happened when I went to the park. Amen. Amen. And that you'll be able to talk to him and figure out. But I mean, yeah, it, it, there is a balance. Yeah, you know, it's not like you let them have free reign. No parents let them. <laughs> you know, I want to share this, Brittany. Uh, but, yeah. My mom, I mean, like, I don't have an intellectual challenge. I have a physical disability. But it was hard for my mom, you know. I remember when, uh, when I started driving for the first time, I bought this van, and, and uh, me and my mom uh, rode to this empty parking lot. So we rolled around the parking lot for almost two hours, you know, until I felt comfortable with the equipment because I had to have some pretty high-tech equipment, you know. And so we was riding back home, and I pulled up to the front door, and I looked over at my mom. I said, I'll see you later. <laughs> she said, where are you going? I said, I'm about to go pick up my best friend, Dave. We finna go ride. <laughs> and my mom got out. And I was pulling off, and I looked in the river mirror, and she was standing there looking like, oh, my God, <laughs> my son's about to go kill himself, you know. Yeah. And she, it was hard, you know, for her to let me go. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think, yeah. I yeah. think yeah. all yeah, parents you know. have that fear, especially once a child turns 16. Yeah. And yeah. They get the, or 15, even. And some of them are like, oh, you hear them say, watch out. So-and-so is, uh, so is now on the road. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and parents do have that fear. Some things are harder because they're more, con they're concerned more. So I'm mm -hmm. not, I mean, I'm just saying, let people with disability make the same amount of mistakes mm -hmm. as you would let your child if, if make if they didn't have a disability. Amen. There's, you do need to protect them from some things. Yeah. Mm. You don't need to just drop them off on this sketchy neighborhood and leave them there by themselves waiting for someone. No. That's, a, that's one instance where, yeah, you want to protect them. So, guys, uh, in closing, we're about to get ready to bring it to a close. I'd like to give you an opportunity to share any final remarks or something that you may have about our topic. Do anybody have any final remarks? I would like to say this, but... I heard, I, um, we hear this a whole lot of times. Kids respect your parents hmm. because if you don't, and then there's a chance that you're gonna end up in jail and you know stuff. Mm -hmm. So just respect your parents because mm -hmm. your parents love you. And I know some kids might say, "Oh, they're mean," you know stuff like that. But sooner or later, when you get older, you're gonna thank them. So you saying having a disability don't give you a pass to be disrespectful, right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I like that. You gotta respect Any, your parents. Anybody else got any closing remarks? Just like just like a yeah, just like a teenage girl could say like my mom is mean even though she's telling them the right thing. That's yeah. right, that's right. And they sometimes say curse words like my mom's going to H E L L. That's right, that's right, that's right. Anybody else got any closing remarks? Before we before we bring it to an end. Thank you.
is a great session. I will be attending others too. Thank you. And uh, I think it will be helpful. Like they talk yeah. to each other. Mm -hmm. So many small, small things like no anger, calmly, handle mm -hmm. calmly. Mm -hmm. You think everybody's saying it's helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to go ahead, Chris. I would like to say that there are a lot of resources and a lot of outlets that are begun that are, that are coming along here in Birmingham uh, for people with disabilities, and I think that um, please take advantage of all of them. Like this, this is a very good support system here, and this is it's really good. Um, I wish I would have had it when I was growing up. It would have been something great that me and my mom could have come to and we would have been able to understand the disability world and the life that was to come for me. Mm -hmm. So it's, this is really good. Like you, also, you, guys, you, I want to... You work at... It, I'm looking at your name tag. You work at a re great resource. Yeah, I want to share... This This is Chris Adams, uh, him and I, good friend of mine. And Chris, um, uh, I don't want to close without giving you an opportunity to just share it with them. Tell them your position at your organization. Okay. You uh, tell them about your organization. Okay, I work at Disability Rights and Resources. Um, we are an independent living organization, so we teach independent living. Uh, we do, and we teach self advocacy. Um, we teach life skills. I work in the employment specialist uh, department, so I help um, disabled individuals obtain employment. Um, and obtain the necessary skills to gain to gain a job. So I, I help people deal with resumes, help with online applications. Uh, I help them. I help them uh, put together any type of uh, like Medicaid application, anything like that. We, it, it's a full circle that we deal with home modification. We help people transition outside of nursing homes back into the real world. Um, and so, and there's a number of of referral information that we can give as well if you ever call our phone number. Um, what is that number and uh, website? My phone number is 205-815-6144 and I'll say it again, it's 205-815-6144. Is um, there a website that can be visited? Yes, dradvocates.org is our, is our website. Share that again. DRRadvocates.org. That is our website. Um, and there, if you give, if you even if you just give that phone number a call, if you're not looking for employment, I can get you situated to any type of life skills that you're looking for, home modifications, or anything else that you may need that we may can provide services for. So those of you who are listening online, please take advantage of that resource as well. We also deal with youth. We also deal with transitioning youth into adulthood, into college. So we deal with high school age students. So 14 through 18 is what we deal with. Amen. So, so I want to also share, um, um, uh, Susan Ellis uh, shared some information uh, with me. She's uh, executive director of People First. And so they have a new program that they are doing. And so uh, and they are really targeting uh, youth, a uh, youth leadership program and they are looking for youth between the ages of 16 to 26 ish with developmental disabilities and so on august the 24th their theme is going to be on health and they are going to be meeting at 1929 canyon road vestavia hills alabama 35216 uh, you can call susan directly at 205 Four two two five zero zero six for more information about that program. So I want to thank you all. Can I can I close? Yeah, thank uh, thank you all so much for being here today. I really appreciate all of your input. Uh, means a lot to me that you came and actually shared today with us as this being our one year anniversary for these specific classes. So. Thank you all so much for being here today. Um, Alexander, thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to go live today. And I want to thank those of you online who, who commented and, and watched uh, the video today. Um, I'm, I'm so grateful. So thank you so much. And uh, coming up next week, we are going to look at um, on August the 8th, same time at 1.30. We're going to talk about self-determination, decision-making, and goal-setting. And we're going to have a special guest, Miss Alicia Finley. She's a wonderful young lady. You do not want to miss this young lady. She is powerful. Thank you for being here today. Have a great day.